A torrent of popery more oblivious, feculent, and deadly than the waters of Leith and Asphaltius united has been rushing for years through the wide domain of the Episcopal churchdom. Yet no vigorous arm of discipline is stretched forth to arrest or advert it. Nor can anything of the kind be done so long as the, quote, lords over God's heritage, unquote, are pleased passively or approvingly to look on, and the few who feel otherwise content themselves with softly whispering a, di a diffident sigh of alarm. About thirty years after the rise of Methodism and revivals under Wesley and Whitfield, on the eleventh day of March, 1768, a solemn co a convocation was held in the University of or uh, Oxford by the vice-chancellor and some heads of houses, when for a constructive breach of some academic or ecclesiastical canons, in other words, quote, for holding Methodistical tenets and taking up them to pray, read, and expound the scriptures and singing hymns in a private house, unquote. Sentence of expulsion was formally pronounced against six young gentlemen, junior members at St. Edmund Hall, highly distinguished for their religious and moral conduct. About the same time, however, these erudite apostolic dignitaries, on the plea of intoxication, acquitted Mr. Welling, who, on the eve of his ordination to deacon's orders in the church, had been charged on oath with reviling the scriptures and ridiculing miracles. Thus it was demonstrated that blasphemy and drunkenness were better qualifications than for admission into clerical office than true piety and pure morals. And for anything and for anything appears from the progress of relaxed discipline, gross idolatry and superstition may be still better now. A conscientious minister attempting to exercise scriptural discipline is liable to legal prosecution and civil penalties. The fourteenth canon enacts that, quote, no minister shall refuse or delay to christen any child according to the book of common prayer that is brought to the church to him on Sundays or holidays to be christened, unquote, on pain of being suspended by his bishop, quote, from his ministry by the space of three months, unquote. And Dr. Wilson, the excellent prelate before mentioned, was, in 1722, cast into a sepul sepulchral dungeon in Castle Russian, Isle of Man, where he lay nine weeks and nearly lost his life for the atrocious crime of having refused the sacrament to Mrs. Puller, who had been detected, sola cum solo in loco suspecto, in acts of indecent familiarity with Captain Horn, governor of the island. That from Wilson's Life and Works, eight volumes. Charles the Second son of the royal Episcopal martyr and supreme head of the Anglican Church, visited his mistresses openly, and for the comfort of Her Majesty and, quote, the peculiar edification of his chaplains, bishops, and courtiers, he usually went from the lodging of these accommodating ladies to the National Church, even on sacrament Sundays, when this devout monarch received the Holy Communion, unquote. It is justly said by Mr. Bristed, quote, when excommunication was practiced, its thunders fell not on notorious sinners against morality, but on rebels against ecclesiastical authority. And now that its thunders are silent, all who are now all who are not avowed dissenters are esteemed members of the state church from the splendid profligates among the aristocracy, whose divorce bill, bills continually occupy the attention of Parliament, down to the convicted felons in the Newgate calendar. Unquote. That from Thoughts on the Anglican and Anglo-American Churches, pages one seventy-six and one seventy-seven, as well as seventy-one and seventy-two, published in London, eighteen twenty-three. Oh, that some Hercules would cleanse this Augin stable. It is admitted that the Church of Scotland has the power of discipline, though the letters patent of King William to her first assemblies after the Revolution and succeeding events with recent decisions of the Supreme Civil Courts prove that she does not hold it free and unfettered. And here a footnote, quote, Letters patent, unquote, are writing sealed with the great seal of England, by which a man is authorized to do or enjoy anything which of himself he could not. They are so called on account of their form, being open with their seal affixed, ready to be exhibited for the confirmation of the authority delegated by them. She has offended grievously against the supreme authority of her invisible yet glorious head, by a long course of laxity, tyranny, and partiality in the public administration of it. Shocking laxity was discovered in admitting the curates. The Erastian Act of Comprehension did not require even a shadow of repentance for their past enormities. It commanded the assembly to, quote, purge out none but the insufficient, negligent, erroneous, or scandalous, unquote, as if these attributes had not adhered almost to the whole of them as closely as the bark does to the tree. 
They all had such characters, if Burnett speaks truth, and were guilty to boot of apostasy, perjury, and persecution. Yet the brief space of, quote, thirty days after their application, unquote, was all the time allowed for the work of purging them out. They had no desire themselves of being received on the ground of acknowledgment or profession of repentance, and they were troubled with nothing of the kind. They were received on the, quote, easy terms, unquote, of taking illimited oaths to the government and subscribing a formula which pledged them to nothing regarding Presbyterianism, but the simple truism that, quote, the church government, as now settled by law, is the only government of this church, unquote. The First Assembly declared, quote, that this assembly will depose no incumbent simply for their judgment and net the government of the church, unquote. And Defoe says, quote, in fact, no man was ever since the revolution dispo uh, deposed by the church merely for being Episcopal, nor was any process ever commenced against any man on that foundation, unquote. He states further, quote, there was at the time of the union of the two parliaments in 1707, nearly 20 years after the revolution, 165 Episcopal ministers, then possessing churches and stipends in Scotland, who had no other qualification required of them than the taking the oaths to the government, and were not bound to, neither did they comply with or submit to the Presbyterian Church, unquote. That from Memoirs of the Church of Scotland, pages 318 and 320. Hundreds of tested and untested curates were allowed to continue the ministers of their parishes and act in church courts. One of them was twice chosen moderator of the assembly and made professor of divinity in Edinburgh College. The Presbyterian ministers freely interchanged services with them, and several who had been deposed by their respective synods for preaching the worst Arminianism were reponed by the next commission and no fault was found. All this was directly contrary to the word of God, Ezekiel 44, verses 10, as well as 13 through 15, as well as the acts and constitution of the church, but it illustrates the maxim, quote, in things ecclesiastical we decide all, unquote. For the assembly instructed their commissions and other judicatories above 20 times, and still, or excuse me, still to receive more. And in 1712, the, con the commission in addressing Queen Anne, say with provoking self-complacency, quote, that since our late happy establishment, there have been taking in and continued hundreds of dissenting, that is, Episcopal, ministers upon the easiest terms, unquote. Such an accession of unworthy, time-serving malignants to fill the most sacred offices would have ruined the purity of any church on earth. It betrayed the most shameful laxity of discipline and contempt of the authority of Christ. Nor has the church to this hour recovered from its curse. She... She has ever since sheltered in her bosom a succession of noted her heresiarchs, excuse me, without any adequate censure. Such convicted Arminians, Pelagians, Arians, Socinians, and semi-infidels as Simpson, Crawford, Wishart, Leachman, McGill, and Dalrymple, Dar Dariemple, have uniformly been treated more in the indulgent style of the easy old high priest Eli than after the directions of the Apostle Paul, Romans 16, verse 17, and Titus 2, verse 10. The rebukes which they were visited, if such they could be called, were equivalent to a sanction or toleration, but invariably had that effect. The boldest, most subtle, and stubborn of skeptics, David Hume, received no suitable censure, though he merited the highest, and he was of such good odor and influence in the church as to be able to insist on naming to his friend Dr. Robinson, Robertson, excuse me, the persons he should ask the government to appoint to two vacant offices, even George Whitfield, an erratic Episcopalian Methodist, who though who though his thrilling eloquence aroused to zeal and ecstasy the torpid and slumbering, introduced and propagated the most latitudinarian sentiments under the shallow pretext of Catholic love, was received with eclat to religious communion. Now is there an instance on record that has been discovered of a minister ever having been deposed by the Church of Scotland for preaching or printing Arminian and Pelagian errors? Dr. David Ritchie was acquitted by the assembly of such a charge the other year on making a general and dubious profession of orthodoxy without the principles of his expository work on the epistle to the Romans being investigated. The exercise of discipline towards church members in general has also been slack and unfaithful. It is confined to very gross immorality, indeed almost exclusively to the single species of it which regards a breach of the seventh commandment. 
The matter is commonly managed in private, and censure not unfrequently commuted for money, which enables one class of delinquents to escape altogether. It is impossible that congregational discipline can be observed, as in some parishes there are no resident elders, and have been no session for many years. And here a footnote. Last February, when a presentation was laid on the table of the Presbytery of Perth for Mr. John Struthers to be assistant and successor in the parish of Ryden, of Rind, excuse me, three of their number were appointed to make up a roll to, to the male heads of families, there being, there being, it appeared, no Kirk session to do it. Even where there are elders, the people are not consulted and have no effective voice in their election, though there be no act of parliament preventing. In many cases there are Episcopalians when they have opportunity, and are often, it is believed, about as well qualified for the office of being lords of the admiralty. After, after the revolution, many who had been persecutors, whose hands were deeply dyed in the blood of the saints, were admitted without even a shadow of censure to sit and act as elders in the Supreme Court. But the remissness of the administration of the discipline, tyranny and oppression have been added. To crush opposition to their career of defection, the assembly resorted to measures the most despotic. In the beginning of the 18th century, they ordered their commission to censure and apply to the magistrate for suppressing and punishing a number of faithful ministers. The head in front of those offending were that they pled in a firm but orderly and respectful way for truth and reformation against error and defection. And here a footnote. Several, on account of their attachment to the Covenant of Reformation, were, in 1715, proclaimed rebels at the Market Cross, which shows how truly the moderator of assembly in 1723 declared ex cathedro nemine contra decente that the church was not now upon that footing. Unquote. One of these... The most conscientious, and therefore the most obnoxious, the Reverend John McMillan of Balmahy in Galloway, was unconstitutionally and unrighteously deposed, and afterwards ejected from the manse, glebe, and parish to make room for an intruder ob uh, ordained eight miles from the church, who had only sixteen obsequious persons to receive him. In 1733, the worthy fathers of the secession were sovereignized over and treated in the same rigorous and arbitrary manner. Three years before this, the Assembly enacted that reasons of dissent against the determinations of church judicatories should not be entered in the registers. The only way, therefore, by which ministers could exonerate themselves of sinful decisions and grievous increasing defections was by testifying against them doctrinally in their pulpit ministrations. But for daring to do this, these faithful men were suspended and cut off. A sentence equally harsh and imperious was denounced and executed against the Reverend Thomas Gillespie, Minister of Carnock, in 1752. Here a footnote. The censures of the church, say, says Sir Henry Moncrief, on this occasion fell on individuals who were all acknowledged to be men of integrity and principle, of whose sincerity there was no suspicion. Mr. Gillespie, in particular, on whom the, se the severe censure fell, was charged with nothing but his absence from Inverkeithing, in in Inverkeithing, on the day appointed for the induction of the presentee, for accepting his attendance, he had no duty imposed on him, which could have been affected by his absence, unquote. That from Life of Dr. Erskine. The scriptural, the scripture rule, quote, neither as being lords over God's heritage, unquote, was never more inverted by popes or bishops than in these and similar instances. Even the privilege of being heard by petition, a right inheritance in in the members of every free society, has been tyrannically denied to the Christian community. A representation complaining of certain corruptions and craving redress, signed by 1,700 private members of the church, was presented in 1732. But the assembly refused to hear it, and would not allow a protest against such extraordinary procedure, taken in due form by 15 ministers to be recorded.